This continues the lecture on centripetal force. Let's immediately take a look at our next example. In our next example, we're going to examine what is called the rotor ride. It's a specific type of carnival ride, and you may be familiar with this situation from your own experience. The ride consists of a cylindrical room. You go into the room, you stand up against the wall, then the room spins up to uniform circular motion, and then the floor drops and somehow everybody is stuck to the wall. Let's examine that problem in some detail. I'm also going to use this problem to introduce you to the idea or the concept of what is called centrifugal force, but we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Okay, go ahead and copy the problem down into your notes. Let me read it to you here. A rotor ride at an amusement park has a radius of 1.5 meters. The rotational period equals 2.0 seconds. How many g's of acceleration does a rider experience? Once we make this calculation, you'll begin to understand why this ride is considered to be somewhat uncomfortable. Okay, now if you're not familiar with the ride, here's the basic geometry I'm going to draw in profile. We have this cylindrical room like so. So here's a cylinder, like this. Okay, and then the axis of rotation then passes through the geometrical center of the cylinder like so. If the axis did not pass through the center of the cylinder, I wouldn't get on that ride. Okay, and then it spins up to uniform circular motion like so. And then we have a rider like this stuck up against the wall and the floor has dropped. Okay, as the rider here circulates on the diagram, the rider has a centripetal acceleration, a sub c, that's inwards towards the center of the circle, which is here along the axis of rotation. Okay, and then we have the following numbers. These numbers, by the way, are typical for this ride. We have radius here, r, uh, 1.5 meters, and then the period of the rotation is 2.0 seconds. So let's examine the forces that are acting on the person as the person rotates through the ride. There are three forces acting on the person. First of all, we have the force of gravity, mg straight downwards, like so. And then preventing the rider from slipping downwards would have to be a force of static friction pointing upwards like so. The force of static friction occurs if two surfaces are not moving relative to each other. So then therefore, we have friction like so, which I'm going to label as small f, thereby preventing the rider from slipping. Okay, and then in addition to that, we also have a surface that the person is against. So then therefore, there's a normal force that points inwards towards the center of the circle like so thereby giving us the centripetal acceleration, that is, like this. Okay, now, throughout this unit on dynamics thus far, when setting up situations involving F equals MA, we've been doing so from a very specific point of view, what is called an inertial reference frame. Okay, an inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is at a constant velocity, usually assumed for simplicity to be simply at rest. In other words, it's as if we're just here in this room at rest, watching the rotation occur here on the board, and we then describe the forces that are acting on the person. I've been doing this throughout our unit on dynamics over and over and over. I just haven't stated it as such. But for now, we are examining the situation from what is called an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is at a constant velocity. Okay, that constant velocity is usually assumed to be zero just for simplicity. Once again, it's as if we're just sitting here in this room. Okay, now from the inertial point of view, let's go ahead and add the forces here by using F equals MA. Okay, first of all, in the vertical direction, everything cancels out here. There's no acceleration vertically, so the force of friction is equal to the person's weight, mg. But then in the radial direction now, that is inwards towards the center of the circle, here's then how we write F equals MA. We have one force acting on the person, and that's the normal force, and that then equals mass times acceleration. But keep in mind that the acceleration is the centripetal acceleration of v squared over r. Like so. And then in just a few moments to solve the problem, what we'll do is take this portion of the expression, cancel out the mass, and then we'll just go ahead and calculate the acceleration. When we calculate the acceleration, we'll then compare the acceleration to 9.8 meters per second squared by calculating how many g's of acceleration the rider experiences. 
Before we finish that, however, which just takes a couple of extra steps, now what we want to do briefly is we want to examine the situation from the rider's point of view. So from the rider's point of view, the reference frame itself now is what is called a non-inertial reference frame. A non-inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is accelerating. Okay, once again, a non-inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is accelerating. In other words, picture the cylindrical room as your point of view. So for those of you that have experienced this ride, I'm going to draw on your own experience in just a few moments, but picture the room itself as a reference frame. If you do, it's a non-inertial reference frame because the room itself has an acceleration, in this case, a centripetal acceleration. So a non-inertial reference frame is a reference frame that has an acceleration. Okay, and now let's picture the situation from your point of view inside the ride. What forces do you feel? Well, of course you still feel gravity straight downwards, like so. You still feel friction upwards preventing you from slipping. You are still against the surface and then therefore you still feel the normal force but in addition to that, from your point of view, you feel something pulling you away from the center of the circle. That's what's called the centrifugal force. Like so. The centrifugal force is an example of what is called a fictitious force. The reason why it's called fictitious is because is there actually anything physically there pulling you away from the center of the circle? No. So for that reason, the force is referred to as fictitious. Fictitious forces arise in non-inertial reference frames. Now, ultimately, what causes you to feel this fictitious force? It's a combination of two things. First of all, the fact that you have inertia. In other words, if we go back up to this diagram, and we consider the room to be rotating, and here you are as a passenger inside the ride, at this moment, your velocity vector is in this direction. However, think of this as a representation of your inertia. You have a tendency to remain in motion like so. But then secondly, in addition to your inertia, we also have the fact that the room itself is rotating like this. So the combination then of your inertia and the fact that the room is rotating causes you to feel that fictitious force from your point of view that's referred to as the centrifugal force. This is kind of not quite the right way of saying it, but you can kind of think of the centrifugal force as you sort of feeling your own inertia as you begin to rotate through the room. Fictitious forces, such as the centrifugal force, they arise in non-inertial reference frames. So the centrifugal force is caused by the rider's inertia and the fact that the room is rotating. It has an acceleration. Fictitious forces arise in non-inertial reference frames. Make sure you pause if necessary to write this information down. Once again, the centrifugal force is an example of a fictitious force. Okay, let me give you a few other simple conceptual examples of fictitious forces. So consider those scenarios involving a car that I use to describe the law of inertia at the opening of my qualitative lectures covering the laws of motion. So consider the following situation. You're in a car, it's moving down the freeway at a constant velocity. It's moving at a constant speed in a straight line. And then the driver applies the brakes to the car. There's a force exerted on the car that causes the car to slow down. That force, however, is not exerted upon you. So then therefore you continue moving forwards because you have inertia that is, until a force is exerted upon you, hopefully from your seatbelt. However, now consider the car itself to be a reference frame. 
And as it slows down, it has an acceleration, so then therefore it's a non-inertial reference frame. From your point of view inside of the car, you feel something pulling you forwards. Once again, there's nothing really there physically pulling you forwards. The fictitious, fictitious force that you are feeling is caused by the fact that you have inertia and you're in a non-inertial reference frame. Same thing involving the following scenario of a car that we looked at as well. Let's say that the car, for example, is initially at rest, and then the driver applies the accelerator to the car. There's a force exerted on the car, causing the car to accelerate forwards. Okay, that force is not exerted upon you, so then therefore you remain at rest relative to the ground until something pushes you. However, from your point of view inside the car, once again, the car is a non-inertial reference frame, you feel a fictitious force pulling you backwards like so while you're in the car from your point of view. Once again, there's nothing actually physically there pulling you backwards. It's caused by the fact that you have inertia, in this case, a tendency to remain at rest, and the car is beginning to accelerate forwards. So fictitious forces always occur in non-inertial reference frames. Okay, now here's kind of like the punchline, if you will, for this qualitative description of fictitious forces. Consider the surface of the Earth. Is the surface of the Earth an inertial reference frame? No, it's a non-inertial reference frame because the surface of the Earth, of course, is rotating as the Earth itself rotates on its axis. So then, therefore, standing here in this room right now, am I, in fact, feeling a very slight fictitious force caused by the Earth's rotation? Yes. And here's how it works. Okay, I'm going to have to do some erasing here. I will redraw this in a few minutes when I get back to the actual problem. Okay, but let's now consider the rotating Earth. So what we do, the surface of the Earth is then therefore a non-inertial reference frame. Okay, let me go ahead and draw the Earth in profile, like so. So here's the Earth's equator. Okay, right here is the North Pole of the Earth. Right here is the South Pole of the Earth. And let me go ahead and draw in the axis of rotation itself, like so. Passing through the poles and through the center of the Earth like this. And then here we are, for example, say, I am, that is, standing here in this room in Los Angeles. Okay, now in this room, by the way, when I face in this direction towards the rear of the classroom, this is north. And then therefore, when I face in this direction, this is south. So on this diagram, this way is north and this way is south. Okay, and then as the Earth rotates, I trace out a circle. I trace out a circle that is parallel to the equator. This is what is referred to as a parallel of latitude. I'm going to go ahead and draw that circle here in green like so. Okay, and then as I circulate here on a diagram as the Earth rotates, I do have a centripetal acceleration vector that is inwards towards the center of this green circle. Notice that that is not straight down towards the center of the Earth, which would be in this direction like so. Instead, it's off on an angle, like so, in this direction like so, towards the north. So if I face towards the north here in this room, this green arrow here is roughly in this direction like so, looking down towards the axis of rotation. Now, from my point of view in the non-inertial reference frame, I then therefore feel a very slight centrifugal force away from the center of that circle. That is, in this direction, towards the south. So then therefore, if I take an object, for example, and I drop it vertically like so, does it actually fall straight down? Not quite. It does, in fact, drift a little bit to the south due to this fictitious centrifugal force. The amount of drift to the south is next to nothing. It's less than a tenth of a degree. So you are never going to notice this with your senses. And the reason for it is because the Earth's rotation is slight, but it is physically detectable. The first time that the Earth's rotation was physically detected was in the 19th century with a very famous experiment that was devised by a French mathematician named Foucault. Foucault designed an experiment involving a pendulum.
as the pendulum oscillates back and forth, essentially it's like the earth rotates out from underneath it. So then therefore, from our point of view in the non-inertial reference frame of the surface of the earth, we see a fictitious sideways force appearing to be exerted upon the pendulum. And as the pendulum oscillates, we see it drift to the side and it's caused by this fictitious force, ultimately from the non-inertial reference frame of the earth's surface point of view. There is a very famous example of Foucault's pendulum somewhere in Los Angeles. You may have seen it. It's in the lobby of the Griffith Observatory in Griffith Park. So in the lobby at Griffith Observatory, there is an extremely large pendulum. That pendulum there is an example of Foucault's pendulum. If you watch that pendulum over the course of a couple of minutes, you're going to begin to see it noticeably drift towards the side. The reason for that is because it's detecting, if you will, the fictitious force exerted upon it due to the Earth's rotation. So physical detection of the Earth's rotation, it turns out, is actually quite difficult. It wasn't done until the 19th century with Foucault's pendulum, but it is, in fact, measurable. In the case of an object that is dropped vertically using modern equipment, you can actually show that the object does drift a little bit to the south, but the amount of drift is very small. It's only by about a tenth of a degree. And the reason for this, once again, is because the Earth's rotation is rather slight. Okay, now let's go ahead and get back to the problem at hand. Let me redraw the diagram here on the lower board for the non-inertial point of view. All right, so here we are back in the non-inertial point of view. And then from a rider's perspective inside the ride, once again, we have the following forces. We have, first of all, the force of friction. We've got the force of gravity. We've got the normal force, and now we've got the centrifugal force, like so. And now let's add things up by using F equals ma. When I do, however, we need to know what the acceleration is. So let me ask you this, for those of you that have ridden this ride, from your point of view inside the ride, what is your acceleration? Here's a way in which you can think about that question. Let's say that there are other riders inside the room with you. According to you, what is their acceleration? It's zero because everybody is just standing there against the wall, according to you, inside the ride. This then means that, from the non-inertial point of view, all of the forces then therefore cancel each other out. This then means that vertically we have, for example, friction, once again, equaling the person's weight. And now in the horizontal direction, we have the normal force here equal to the centrifugal force. Like so. But from the top board, we already know what the normal force is. It's mass times acceleration. It's the centripetal force, the net force from the inertial reference frame. Like so. The amount of fictitious force that you feel in a non-inertial reference frame is equal to ma. It's equal to your mass multiplied by your actual acceleration from the inertial point of view. So the value of the centrifugal force is the same as the value of the centripetal force, but the meaning of those two words is different. Centripetal refers to the net force from the inertial point of view. Centrifugal refers to the fictitious force from the non-inertial point of view. Regardless, however, you basically end up with the same set of equations to describe the non-inertial point of view as you do earlier with the inertial point of view. This then means that, in theory, you could actually set up a situation from either reference frame, that is, inertial or non-inertial, and arrive at the exact same expressions to then solve the problem. However, at the introductory level, we usually always do things from the inertial reference frame, as we've been doing here throughout this unit on dynamics. And the reason for that is because sometimes from the non-inertial point of view, the fictitious forces could be a bit difficult to identify. So even though you end up with the same sets of equations from either perspective, usually we just do things from the inertial point of view because it's usually a little easier to do so. Okay, so I'm using this example here, obviously, to introduce you to the concept of centripetal force and fictitious forces. Let's go ahead and conclude, however, at this point and just solve the problem. All right, so let me go ahead and erase this and let's just get back up to the top board. Okay, so as I said a little while ago, right here is basically what I need to solve for. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out the mass from both sides of the expression here, and then therefore the centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius. Let's go ahead and find the speed v. Now the speed v, if you recall from uniform circular motion, is the circumference of the circle divided by the period. 
So let me go ahead and take this expression for the speed, plug it into here, square each of the terms, and then I'm going to divide out by a radius. When I do, I end up with the following expression. Like so. So take a look at that carefully. 2 squared is 4, and then we have pi squared, but then r squared over r, so there's only a single r here, and then divided by t squared, like so. And now let's go ahead and plug in and get our answer. Okay, so doing so, I have 4 times pi squared times the radius of a room, and then divided by 2 squared. And I end up then with about 14.8 or so meters per second squared. Notice that this is larger than a G. A G is 9.8 meters per second squared. So let's go ahead and finish now by calculating the number of G's. The number of G's is the number of 9.8s, if you will, that the value of acceleration has. The term G-force, by the way, is somewhat of a misnomer because what we're actually comparing here are just accelerations. So I'm gonna take 14.8 and then divide that by 9.8. Notice that there are no units associated with this. All of the meters per second squared cancel out. So divide by 9.8, this comes out to be about 1.5 Gs, as we said, like so. So then therefore, if you were a rider inside this ride, the amount of centrifugal force that you would feel pulling you away from the center of the circle is one and a half times your weight. It's as if somebody who weighs one and a half times your weight is applied equally to your body as you're pressed up against the wall. This is why this ride is considered to be somewhat uncomfortable. So then therefore, typically what happens in a ride such as this is that you go into the room, you stand up against the wall, they spin you up the uniform circular motion, and then the floor drops, and they basically leave you there for maybe 15 or 20 seconds or so. Because after about 20 seconds, at the most a half a minute, something like this becomes a bit uncomfortable. How many of you have ridden the ride Goliath at Magic Mountain? That's a really good roller coaster. There's a portion of that ride where you go through a couple of helical loops like this. When you go through that portion of the ride, which lasts in the neighborhood of about 10 or 15 seconds, you're getting about four and a half Gs. Four and a half Gs is a lot on a roller coaster, and something like that is actually kind of towing the line, if you will, between what's fun and what's actually a little dangerous. If you're talking about fighter pilots, for example, when they execute what are called high G turns, those are really tight turns at a great speed. In some cases, they're getting about nine Gs. Nine Gs is a lot. What prevents those pilots from passing out when they execute those turns? Well, in their flight suits, the suits that they wear when they're actually flying the plane, integrated into the flight suits are bladders of water such that when they get pressed into their seats when they're executing these turns, those bladders of water then press on their arteries to try to force the blood up to their brain to keep them awake. So the next time that you ride the ride Goliath and you're going through the helical loops that give you about four and a half Gs or so for a few seconds, if you kind of feel yourself starting to go gray a little bit, well, the reason why is because the blood is actually not getting back up to your brain. So just be careful when you ride that ride at Magic Mountain. Let me go ahead and conclude this video here.